really put James, the brother of Jesus, on the map. Before we wrote these books in the 1990s, early 2000s, nobody really had even thought about Jesus having a brother. And what does it mean that for him to have a brother? Well, it flies in the face of all, all Catholic and other Christian ideology, actually. Because if he has a brother, then first of all, he is not supernatural. Second of all, Mary is not a virgin. And then it goes on and on and on and on. The, the, the normative Catholic response to this is, oh, he was only a cousin. He, it was a different, he was a son by a different mother. Well, th that is Jerome in the fifth century, fourth to fifth century. But actually, uh, that's a, a theological response. There is no proof of that at all. All the texts speak of James, he, uh, Greek name, uh, well, Hebrew name Yaakov, uh, but but uh, Greek name Jacob, uh, Jacobus. Uh, but he's also always called the righteous one. All the texts speak of James the just. I don't know if you ever heard of that. James the just. We get, I think, James from Spanish into English. So he's also called James the just, James the righteous one. And what put me on it was my work in the Dead Sea Scrolls. I'm somewhat known for working uh, pretty extensively in the Dead Sea Scrolls, been out there, done a lot of archaeological work, and broke the monopoly on the scrolls, which was again controlled by the church, uh, on the interpretation of these scrolls. Now, one of the problems in the interpretation of the scrolls is we always heard they were Essenes, but no one ever understood what an Essene was. They were supposed to be peaceful Essenes, basically contemplating, contemplating their navels, if you like, out in the wilderness someplace. But if you read their doctrines, this is not a peaceful group. They are not a loving group. They don't love their uh, they don't love their neighbors. They hate the sons of the pit. They're not turning the other cheek, uh, and they're preparing for the final apocalyptic war against all evil on the earth. Now, how are they going to win? There's actually a war scroll outlining this. How are they going to win this final war? They're going to have these desert camps, and they're living in desert camps. And in the desert camps, the um, sectaries, if you want to call it, are practicing absolute purity regulations according to Hebrew law. Why are they practicing absolute purity regulations? Because they're a holy army, and they have a secret atomic weapon. The secret atomic weapon is the holy angels. And they are preparing for the holy angels to join their camps. I have this crazy idea that the holy angels will not join the camps if there's any human impurity there. So there cannot be any sexual intercourse, any, any wet dream at night, anything of that kind. And everything has to be perfectly, perfectly pure, no women, unfortunately. Everything perfectly pure. The reason being, if the holy angels are going to come, come down and fight the whole might of the Roman Empire, and all the rest of the peoples on the earth who are evil, the ones who are evil, then, then then they have, to, they have to be able to go back up to heaven, and they can't go back up to heaven if they encounter human impurity. Okay, let me, why did I introduce it with that? Because the leader of this group is called the righteous teacher, or the teacher of righteousness. And when you look at him, when you hear about him in the, in the texts, he's always called the tzaddik. The underlying text in Hebrew, whether it's in the Habakkuk commentary, uh, the, the, the prophet Habakkuk and the commentary on that, or any of the other uh, commentaries on different prophets, the word Zadik is always more a in the interpretation. Okay, move over to James. James is the just. What is the just? In Hebrew, the Zadik. Who is he? Well, the problem is distinguishing between literature and history. Now, people all love the Gospels. They all know the Gospels. But no one knows the really historical materials of the New Testament because the Gospels are the storybook materials of the New Testament. Those are the art, but those are more like, how should we put it, um, literature. Those are not history. And we know from the material, they're not history. In fact, they're, I've said finally at the end of this book, that what they do is they reverse everything in the, in the Dead Sea Scroll, in the Dead Sea Scrolls to the absolute letter. Why am I drawing these parallels? Because I want to get closer to the Moray Hatzedek, the teacher of righteousness, to James the Righteous One. 
Yaakov, the righteous one. Both of them are leaders of communities. Now, where do we hear about James the just? So you speak to an ordinary Christian, and he says, well, some brothers of Jesus are mentioned in the scripture, James, Josie, Simon, and Jude. Josie's being just a variation on the, on the name Jesus. So his, uh, one, his, Jesus has turned into his actual brother, and so on and so forth. Uh, but they know the Gospels, but they don't know the historical parts of the New Testament. What are the historical parts of the New Testament? Paul's letters. Not all of them, but the ones scholars generally agree are historical. Which one? When I went to California, Cal State Long Beach, no one wanted a course that didn't have Jesus in it. So I ended up teaching courses that I didn't know anything about because my dissertation was on Islamic law in Palestine and Israel. So I had to teach, we had to teach, mandated by state law, four courses a term, eight courses a year. If you didn't want to go crazy and teach the same course over and over and over again, I mean, a place like Princeton, Yale, Cambridge, Har uh, Harvard, or wherever, the professors maybe teach two courses a term or, a term or one. They might teach three courses in, in a year, and it has to be in their discipline. I had to teach things in every discipline. So I learned Christianity as I went along. Islam, I knew. Judaism, I began teaching Old Testament and so on, all the way up to modern, modern Jewish thought and Zionism. All these are on YouTube should you want to look at them, all the courses, eight courses that I have taught. So one develops a certain breadth of, of, of uh, insight and knowledge there. For instance, I can tell you, Muhammad knows James's instructions to overseas communities. You say, well, what are James's instructions of overseas, to overseas communities? Where did these come from? Ah. Well, you'd have to read Acts and know that suddenly Acts 15, very few people really read Acts for themselves, the narrative changes. You go from a he, she, they Our history. And so you come to a thing where Jerusalem Council, where James, who has never been introduced in Acts, the other James having disappeared, James the brother of John, some people think he went to Spain and so on, but he was he was killed according even to, even to the book of of Acts, never got out of Palestine if he ever existed. He looks like a stand-in for the real James. Why are these stand-ins? Because the real James, James the brother of Jesus, is so embarrassing. In any case, in the book of Acts, his instructions to overseas communities are abstain from blood, which is Hebrew doctrine, uh, things sacrificed to idols, fornication, etc. If you look at Islamic dietary law and, oh, oh, uh, and uh, uh, things that uh, carry on, things that have died of themselves or have been ripped by other animals. If you look at Islamic dietary law, it's exactly the same. Abstain from blood, uh, uh, carrion, uh, et cetera, things, sacrificed idols, and this kind of thing. They've picked up James's instructions to the letter. Why hasn't Christianity? Because Paul attacks them viciously in his letters. Now, people don't know these letters, so they don't know that Paul is full of envy, anger. Uh, he, he, he actually, I don't like to say it, he actually hates James. But we wouldn't even know James existed if we didn't have, take, let's take Galatians. Galatians is the key letter. Almost no Christian I've ever met uh, who's not a professional person has ever read Galatians for themselves. And if you read chapter 1, there it is. He, Paul says he went up to Jerusalem after his first inspiration and he saw no one but James the brother of the Lord and Peter. And then in chapter 2 he says, these super apostles, not that their importance means anything to me, and in the meantime, he's down in Antioch, which is probably not along the coast, but in northern Syria. And what's happening there? He says, the representatives of James, i.e. James, the brother of Jesus, came down. And Peter, who used to keep table fellowship with Gentiles, I'm not saying you should or you shouldn't, but according to Hebrew dietary law, you wouldn't be able to, stopped keeping table fellowship with, with um, Gentiles. And Barnabas followed him in this hypocrisy. He actually uses, calls Peter and Barnabas hypocrites. Uh, you know, um, Augustine in Northern Africa wrote, wrote uh, Jerome in the fifth century and said, how dare, how dare Paul call Peter a hypocrite? <laughs> well, uh, 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 Jerome wrote back and said, there are some things we shouldn't answer or cannot answer. And that was the end of that particular uh, question. But then, then, so, Peter it stops keeping table fellowship with uh, Gentiles, but the point is, Peter defers to James. 
So it's clear Peter is not the leader of the early church. The leader of the early church is James. I've only got a short time here, so I want to just you know, compress things a, a little bit further so we can get to questions and things like that. But just to move on, and that's why I said you must read Galatians for yourself. You can't have someone else read it for you. You can have your priest, minister, or anyone else. You have to read it for yourself and see. You're dealing with a pretty nasty piece of work here. Someone who is not full of love. Where does it come out? Chapter 4 of Galatians. The representatives of James come down to Paul's communities, seemingly in Galatia, and they want to circumcise his communities. You know, uh, in the earlier chapter 2 of Galatians, he calls the sum from James those of the circumcision. He wants to circumcise, and Paul says, in response to these people coming down, whose importance means nothing to him, I wish they would themselves cut off. You look, it's there. Meaning, I wish they would their own, I wish they would their own gonies cut off. Now, this is a very nice fellow. A very, a very tender-hearted, loving fellow. So, um, what happens? How do we know there's in the last part of Acts that there's any proof to all of this? Go forward from Acts 15, 16 to James's instructions where we first meet him and he's not introduced to Paul's last visit to Jerusalem. He comes up and we're in the we document. Probably Luke is uh, writing this and they uh, got it from a, a, some sort of uh, um, uh, memorandum he's been keeping. He said, we came up to Jerusalem and Paul went in to see James to tell him of all the wonderful things we've been doing overseas. And then James responded, this is our James. He's the head of the church. Nobody knows it. He's the head of the church. So James responded, but you see, Paul, we've heard that you've been telling everyone overseas uh, not to practice circumcision, uh, saying things against this, uh, this temple, against the law, and against the people. So to show there's no... This is actually quoted in the book of Acts in the we document, where the we narrative takes over till the end. Uh, to show there's no... And it's a different kind of narrative because it's not supernatural events. It, it isn't any of these things. To show there's no truth to any of these things, we want you to go into the temple and uh, take a Nazarite oath. That's a temporary Nazarite oath. You know, Christianity, Naz Nazarenes are really named after uh, uh, Nazarite-type activities. Qumran is a community of lifelong Nazarites. And uh, Nazarites abstain from certain things. We want to take a, a, a short one, a, a temporary Nazarite oath, and pay for four others, because he's perceived as having money which he's raised overseas. Pay for four others, in other words, to publicly show that there's no truth to the rumors we've heard about you. And he's uh, nothing loath, Paul, of course there is truth, every truth to it. Read the whole book of Acts and you'll see that there's not one moment that he isn't criticizing the temple, the people, and the church, not one letter either, and, and the, and the uh, law. He, nothing loath, he goes into the temple. What, is he being set up? We don't know. But in chapter 21, he goes into the temple and the people see him and they go mad and they say, this is the per person, and, and the we document is recording this who teaches against our people, against our temple, and against this place. And they, they don't want to kill him yet, though Acts says there are people who have taken an Nazarite oath that they will not eat or drink until they have killed Paul. In any event, they throw him, no one in Christianity I know even knows this material, or ever hears of it. They throw him out of the temple. So first we have a James, then we have these, the leader of the community. I already told you we have a James, uh, we have a, a righteous one who's the leader of the Qumran community. They throw him out and, and they bar the door behind him. That's actually said. That's in the scrolls too about barring the door against uh, uh, wrongdoers. What happens? Roman troops up in Antonia in the towers come down and rescue Paul. So that's been obviously prearranged. And what happens? They set Paul up before the crowds and they make the crowds listen to a lecture from Paul. And then they take him down under protective custody to Caesarea, the Roman administrative center. So they're protecting him from these, whoever is, wants to, well, so we say, dispose, get him, whatever. And, and, and this is all in the second part of Acts, the more historical part of Acts. So this is the difference between history and literature. Literature is, you know, something else. And most of the literature we're talking about was written in Rome or Alexandria by Greeks. That's why we don't have any Hebrew versions. So we're getting a kind of 
literary propaganda, the Gospels, no one in Palestine spoke this way and was crucified. There was probably a crucified person. Paul says the only thing he knows about Jesus, which is funny enough, is that he was crucified. So if he was crucified, he was crucified for revolutionary activities. But the Gospels are anxious to show, oh, no, this is a rumor, a lie that the, that, that the Jews are spreading. And Pontius Pilate actually doesn't want to do it, but the Jews force him. But what do we know about Pontius Pilate? Philo goes to Rome in the same period, Philo, the Jewish philosopher in the 30s. And he tells us that Pilate was removed because he was, he was the most violent, unjust, bloodthirsty uh, governor that the Romans ever sent out to Palestine. So square those things if you can. You can't square them. And you see what's being done, a total reversal of history. So going back finally to getting to your questions and things of, the, uh, of that kind, why have I put the scrolls together with the material about James, and this is uh, the early Christian literature is full of material about James the um, the uh, just. Most of it very authentic, and he's always called that as a writer called Hegesippus at the end of the first century. There are others uh, called uh, well, obviously um, there's Eusebius who who uh, collects them later. There's Jerome who talks about where James is buried and so on and so forth. Everybody knew who James, the brother of Jesus, was except us. And why is it important to know it? Because to my mind, this is the authentic messianism of Palestine. What you see is the reversed messianism of the Roman Empire, which turned everything into its mirror opposite to pacify these, these um, groups. I'm summing it up quickly like I know it all, but that's the result of, you know, a 650-page book based on a longer 1,000-page book. And he, his publishing company, has also published a, a, a book I wrote, which is the material we cut out of this, another 1,000 page pages, which upset everybody, called the New Testament Code. So the footnotes didn't get in it and ended up on my website, robertisenman.com. But I think we can end there and have some questions. Yeah. Material, material, historical material in Paul about Christ, except the, the um, crucifixion. The problem is Paul never knew him. He comes later in the day. Now, I have actually written one of the essays that um, Mr. Ilfeld's publishing company has published is uh, called Paul as Herodian, where I have shown that Paul is not even of Jewish background, that he is of the Herodian family, which was imported by the, by the, uh, by the Roman conquerors to rule over Palestine in place of the Maccabeans. And they are a sort of mixed Idumean Greek group of people from the, uh, from the uh, um, Gaza area and from more inland in um, Palestine. And I, I go through why Paul's origins, see the, uh, there's a person in, 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 in uh, Josephus, uh, the Jewish historian of the first century, who also went over to the, to the um, Romans. And by the way, Josephus knows about James. He says, this James who was so beloved by everybody, was executed by the Roman, uh, no, ex executed by the Jews. He was executed by Jewish Pharisees, Jews of the opposite party, not because he believed in Christ, but because he was of the opposite party. And he had gone into the temple and done on Yom Kippur, on the day of atonement, atonement on behalf of the whole people. And he was stoned. And this was in 62 AD. And Josephus knows the date. But he goes over to the Romans. Josephus is so interesting because he describes in his autobiography, if you haven't read it, his, his um, vita, where he's so hated by the Jews because of having become a traitor and going over to the Romans that when uh, Titus, the Roman commander, the son of Vespasian, sends him out to ask the Jews on the on the on the on the uh, Jerusalem walls to on the head and he falls and he said a huge crowd went up from the walls because the Jews thought their enemy Josephus was dead and he's very proud of this he's actually he's actually he actually is 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 glories in this so we have a very complex political situation here which has not been understood by later generations because of the kind of doctrines that have um, grown up. And what we've tried to do is dig under this, both in the New Testament code, another thousand page book, and this James the brother of Jesus book here, to give people the historical data to decide for themselves. We don't say we're right. We don't say you're right. But you need the data to decide who's right. 
and you need the data from the Dead Sea Scrolls, and you need the data from the unread parts of the New Testament and other early church literature. Another question. I, I hope we don't have any ISIS Christians here. Uh, I'll be beheaded. Uh, I, I, I could, I'd be beheaded tomorrow, but the, <laughs> the, the, the point is, uh, no, not Islam is, is, is very interesting, is very interesting in James. Yes, yes, uh, Muhammad is, is adopting a Jamesian position on many things, and he uses Paul, uh, Paul uh, arguments in uh, 1 Corinthians as uh, we are the children of, of Abraham. Paul says we Christians are the true children of Abraham. Uh, through the, through the um, spirit, the Jews are actually the uh, children of Hagar, the second wife. You have to read, you, Paul is incredible. He can be so nasty when he wants. He says, some people, chapter 8 of 1 Corinthians, are so weak, so weak, James we know was a vegetarian, that they will only eat vegetables. We, <laughs> Paul says, you know, don't listen to Jewish law. You know, all the meat in the butcher shops and clean is um, clean. That's in chapter 9 of of uh, one of, of one Corinthians. To me, that's historical material. Yes, to my mind, and I, you can stone me, do whatever you want. The Gospels are. Wait, let me finish. The Gospels are more or less are more or less fiction. Now, I don't think Muhammad understood that. I wouldn't expect to to have understood that because what he was taught, you know, uh, people didn't have that kind of insight in those days. They weren't studying the materials in that way. But the point is, yeah, I think we have a fictional good literature here, and that's why it has been so uh, so um, gripping. But the historical materials, I tell you, are found in some of Paul's letters, are found in parts of Acts, the we parts of Acts, etc. There's more historical material in the we parts uh, of Acts. And uh, the other material, I'm, I, I am afraid, I don't want to call it fiction, but it's, it, it reverses the situation in Palestine almost point for point for point. And they do this. The authors, you see, Josephus, the Jewish historian, he knows Paul has a letter to the Thessalonians where he sends his friend, an apostle, to, not the Thessalonians, uh, the Philippians, to um, Rome and this same apostle and friend of Paul and it becomes Titus's secretary for, for, for uh, Greek letters. And later he, he, he survives and so on. And he also became Nero's secretary before that. In fact, Titus's brother Domitian has, his name is Epaphroditus. Epaphroditus, he's both in Philippians and in Josephus. Josephus dedicates all his works to Epaphroditus. This is the same person that's in Paul's letters. And he is you know, the head of the, uh, of the literary establishment in Rome. And he's a Christian, a uh, Christian of the, uh, of the Orthodox kind. So what happens, um, Domitian, who is, who is Titus's other brother, doesn't like him for some reason and has him executed. Why does he have him executed? Because he apparently held the sword for Nero to run on. And he said, he raised his hand against an emperor. And so he has this Epaphroditus executed. But all this is in Josephus. Josephus has an autobiography, and he dedicates all his works to Epaphroditus, and Epaphroditus is in Paul. So I say, we have this circle there, a very capable circle, not just these people, but others who know the material and know what they're doing and know how to present it in a pro-Roman fashion. You, it's almost impossible to uh, disagree. If you just know the, the uh, theology and have heard others speak or have been taught by others and not looked into it yourself, you'll disagree absolutely. But when you yourself start looking at the material and you discover that Paul is actually not a very loving person, not a very charitable person, actually full of jealousy, envy, and in fact hatred, and shows no Christian virtue whatsoever, then you begin to wonder, but you have to, how will you know it? Your church leaders aren't going to tell you this. That would be divisive. They, they, you have to discover it by reading the material yourself. When you read the material yourself, you say, hey, this guy's as bad as Eisenman, you know? <laughs> so so that, 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 that's what involves uh, reading the material. You have to read Josephus. You have to read Paul's letters. And uh, as I said, you have, to, uh, you have to read the historical parts of the New Testament, which are... Acts 15 onwards, the we document, and some of, uh, as I said, some of Paul's letters. Jamie somehow came out of Jacob, and I'm not uh, enough of a linguist to explain that particular point. Reading a thing for yourself, 
and see if you if you have supernatural events, uh, people walking on waters with uh, with um, with uh, perpetual virgin mothers, and things of that kind, or you have a, a simple thing saying. We went up to Jerusalem. Uh, we went in to see James. James asked us, uh, told us that uh, we've heard the bad, that uh, you were doing these things overseas. Please do this. Take a Nazarite oath, uh, something Paul would be totally opposed to theoretically because he doesn't observe Hebrew law. Well, all these things are very sensible, actual, real, and not supernatural. So if you like supernatural things, well, then it's a, it's an historical book. But if you're a historical, historically minded person, supernatural things are not part of what we normally consider history. They're part of what we normally consider literature. So if you like, you know, uh, 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 that kind of thing, then you would consider that historical too. But I don't think that you can call uh, the first part of the Book of Acts or the Gospels historical. Is there anything historical in the Book of in in the Gospels? Well, I can tell you one thing that isn't historical. Absolutely, the portrait of Pontius Pilate. It's the very opposite of the, of the known Pontius Pilate we know from Josephus, who was a pro-Roman person, and Philo. So, you know, you, you, you've got to make some determinations from your knowledge. If you have no knowledge, then you're not in a position to make these determinations. The Gospels, we all love the Gospels. They're, they're very charming, attractive stories. We know the Knights of the Round Table so, so stories, too. We know all kinds of stories that are very attractive. Just because they're charming and attractive don't make them historical they make them charming and attractive. So the point is, if you want, normally historical material is unattractive. It, it actually deals with material that is sometimes rather repulsive, negative, and unpleasant. And uh, the people involved in it are not doing necessarily things that we would admire. But if you, if you don't read the whole gamut of the material, you can't make the determination of what is, well, I didn't want to use the word fiction, but what is literary, that's a more kind of word, what is literary and what is historical? And I can again say with absolute 100% scientific certainty as far as I'm concerned, maybe not as far as you're concerned, you first have to read it all to make that determination that those letters of Paul that I mentioned, Galatians, Philippians, and so on, 1, one and 2 Corinthians, you read one and, 1 and 2 Corinthians and make the hair on your head stand up if you read it for yourself, not through someone else's eyes. And, and, and those kind of materials... Uh, the we document, as I said, Josephus, etc. The Dead Sea Scrolls, totally historical. I, in fact, I think what we have in the scrolls, people underestimate that. Essenes. No, we don't have Essenes here. There's another historian from uh, from Rome. I think his name was Hippolytus, uh, and he collected uh, Josephus in a different way, and, and and he has four kinds of Essenes. Two kinds of Essenes are Zealot Essenes and Sicarii Essenes. Sicarii Essenes are the name the Romans, Josephus and others, gave the what he, uh, cutthroat Essenes. Because, uh, um, uh, not no, zealots, they gave the extreme, but they weren't even called Essenes. They gave the cutthroat uh, groups of zealots. And what that, the reason they were called Sicarii is, Josephus says, they carried a curved dagger like Arabs do uh, under, their, under their clothing. And, and, and they used this to cut the throats of their enemies. But... What they probably were carrying is a knife, a, circumcise, a circumciser's knife. They were, the, they, they were the party of the circumcision, as Paul calls James's party then. So you can call them Sicarii killers, or you can call them Sicarii circumcisers. So what this Hippolytus version of Josephus says is that the Sicarii Essenes would, um, if they heard anyone talking about the law who was not circumcised, would, like Islam, offer him the choice of circumcision or death. So, you know, these are not nice people, and these are not nice facts, but to my mind, you're getting close to history when you hear things like that. So I think that, that then what do we know? Who committed suicide, Eitan knows, on Masada? The extreme Essenes called Sicarii. And so, and they killed all their whole family rather than be taken Roman, Roman prisoners in 73. So, you know, who are these people? We found Qumran texts up there. Qumran is the name for where the Dead Sea Scrolls were found. Dead Sea Scroll texts up on Masada. So put it all together. What do you have up there? Sicarii Essenes. But these are not peace-loving Essenes. 
These are Essenes of the kind that observe every letter of the law and uh, circumcision and will not allow people to uh, say anything about the law who are not circumcised and who died in the war against Rome the most noble way under every torture rather than give any information or give any other person up. And Josephus makes that, uh, uh, and he makes that uh, that uh, clear about the Sicarii, and Hippolytus makes it clear about the Sicarii. Josephus and Paul, I think Paul too was one. There were there were Gentiles in the Dead Sea Scroll community. That's why I have these long books to analyze the text and show you the passages where we can show that there were God fears. Uh, you know that Gentiles in Christianity are called God fears. We know that there were God fears. The Damascus document. Uh, that was found in the Cairo Geniza and also many copies in the Qumran Dead Sea Scrolls corpus. The, the, the um, Damascus document at the end speaks of the God fears and uh, how they're saved. So there were God fears among them, uh, meaning Gentiles. But they also expelled people who broke any letter of the law. And I think that Paul would be among the expellees. And that would account for his bitterness and also to some degree, his his Herodian background would exp would explain his power. How did he have a Roman citizenship? How did he have a Roman citizenship? Well, if you were Herodians, the Romans had bestowed the Roman citizenship on the whole family. So where did it come from? And why did he, was he so successful in Asia Minor? Because there were Herodian governors all through Asia Minor serving the Roman Empire, meaning Herod, Her Her the family of, of um, Herod. And those final acts... Uh, chapters of the book of Acts have Paul uh, encountering uh, the Herodian uh, 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 um, uh, governor of the time and also uh, some of the royal Jews uh, called uh, Bernad uh, Bernici and, and Agrippa and Agrippa II. And uh, these, are all, these people all betrayed Palestine, Judea, uh, went to Rome uh, with Titus and Vespasian and uh, in fact, Josephus, when he betrayed the cause, was supposed to be leading the revolutionary contingent in Galilee. And then everyone was supposed to commit suicide when the Romans had them surrounded. I'm, I'm having to compress everything. I can't give you the whole uh, material. But Josephus describes it in, in uh, detail. Everyone was supposed to commit suicide. And so what happens is Josephus and nine others, the other two, uh, 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 he and another helped the others commit suicide. And then they go and surrender to the Romans, and they proclaim Vespasian, the Roman commander who destroyed the temple and the Jewish people in Palestine, the world ruler that was going to come out of Palestine to rule the world, that the Christians then turned into the Messiah Jesus. <laughs> I know it's hard for people to comprehend because we've been so brainwashed and indoctrinated with the material that we're familiar with that to look at real historical material, which does exist, and the scrolls have just totally puzzled and bamboozled everybody, I don't know what to make of them, so they think we have peaceful Essenes when you couldn't see a more aggressive, warlike, unpeaceful collection of documents if you bothered reading them for yourselves. So the problem is people have to read for themselves, and that's what his um, publishing company is all about, and that's what we need to do. And without that, we're stuck where we are. And I'm afraid, frankly, we're stuck where we are. Can, can Thank you. Yeah. I hate to, uh, to brag, but I'll do a little bragging. I have a brother who's a famous architect, Peter Eisenman. He's uh, doing a lot of remodeling in Santiago de Compostela. He's done the visitor center there. He's doing the cultural center, which includes an archaeological museum and so on. He's, uh, he's uh, older than me. He did, the, he did the Holocaust Memorial in Berlin, those standing stones there, and, and so on and so forth. So I'm very familiar with Santiago de Compostela. In fact, the uh, the governor of Galicia, which is where Santiago is, invited me to come and see things and talk about James. So um, uh, what I've been asked here, what Andrew has asked, uh, is, is James, who, what James is buried there? Well, here's what I think. First of all, James, the brother of John, may or may not even have existed, and you'd have to read my books to, figure, to go into that material in detail for yourself and decide for yourself what you think. I give you the reasons why I don't think he really existed to any extent, and it's cover for the other James. He's the James, the brother of John. No, James, the brother of Jesus. Anyway, whatever happens to him, by about chapter 8 or 9 or 10 in, in Acts, he's eliminated, he's beheaded. So he never had a chance to get to Spain, for sure, even if he existed. 
So how did this box of bone box get to Santiago de Compostela? You know, Santiago de Compostela is in north, um, uh, northwestern Spain, and it's the center of Christian pilgrimages to this very day. And um, there's a box there. I've seen it. I've been there. You've been there. Yeah. I've seen it. It's under the altar, and it looks like a Hebrew ossuary, a real James ossuary, not the phony one we've been hearing about in the press for the last 10 years, based on our book, A10. Uh, they read it in Palestine, Israel, rather Israel, and they suddenly discovered themselves there was a James, the brother of Jesus, and willy-nilly, lo and behold, an ossuary with the name James, the son of uh, uh, Jacob, the son of Joseph, uh, the brother of Jesus appeared, except the, the, uh, the phraseology, the brother of Jesus seems to most people, I don't want to get into a lawsuit of, uh, of libel or anything here, seemed to a lot of people uh, in a different handwriting. In any case, there is an ossuary in, at Santiago de Compostela. Is it the James ossuary? Why do they think it is the James ossuary? Well, here's how it could have happened. When the Muslims came into Palestine, which would be in the 600-700 period, the 7th, 7th, 8th century, Christian holy sites were no longer so, 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 so carefully or fully protected. So they, Muslims did not stop Christian pilgrims from coming to the land, but they wouldn't necessarily protect Christian artifacts. And so you could have people from Spain. And we know that the, uh, there was a James burial site, uh, Ashwari. There's also, there's even Ar an Armenian church of St. James, meaning the brother of, of uh, Jesus, that says they had the Ashwari there to this day in Jerusalem. In any case, uh, Christian pilgrims could have come, I say, in the 8th, 9th century, when this material suddenly appeared in Spain and brought things like that to Spain and deposited them in the town of, well, St. James. Santiago is St. James. Uh, uh, Compostela is of the fields, I think. In any case, the point of the matter is there are stories about the ossuary at Santiago de Compostela. And my feeling is I would have done this if the governor had finally had me come there and talk. Uh, at my brother's uh, cultural center and so on, that the ossuary there, if, if it is authentic, then it's James, the brother of Jesus' ossuary, not James, the brother of John. And it could be because pilgrims could easily have, have gotten a hold of it and brought it there after the Muslim conquest, which is exactly when it appeared in Spain.